The biggest difference between science fiction and fantasy lies in the way they begin. At their heart, all science fiction and fantasy stories start from a basic but very different foundation. While the words may never appear in the story itself, all fantasy begins from once upon a time. Even in the highly popular Game of Thrones series, that, that's still just a once upon a time experience. Because once upon a time, there was a kingdom in Westeros, and there were some dragons, and murders, and political struggles, and magic, and so on. On the other hand, science fiction starts from a basis of, so what if? There are all kinds of genres of fantasy, high fantasy like Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, comic fantasy like Pratchett's Discworld series. There's urban fantasy like Harrison's Rachel Morgan series, there's dark fantasy and magical realism and surrealist fantasy, and so on. Each has their own story to tell, and each has a different version of what happened once upon a time. Sci-fi is similar in that each genre asks the same what-if question, but in a different way. Hard sci-fi asks what-if within stringent, realistic boundaries. This is the realm of Arthur C. Clarke and Andy Weir. What if a man gets stranded on Mars? What if a man is stranded in orbit around Saturn with a crazy homicidal computer? Military science fiction, where you'll find Honor Harrington and Hammer Slammers ask, what if, about the horrors and the futility of war? Cyberpunk has its own questions, and they run deep into the human psyche. Cyberpunk asks, what if an artificial intelligence achieves sentience? What rights does it have? What happens if it decides that humans aren't worthy of survival? What if corporations ruled the world? What if we could plug ourselves directly into a global communications and information system? What if humans could augment their abilities by fusing with technology directly? What if people create cyborgs, or androids, that look and act entirely human? One of the biggest questions in cyberpunk is, what does it mean to be human? We discuss this when talking about the mostly robotic Motoko Kusanagi of Ghost in the Shell in episode 50. It's a theme in William Gibson's Idoru where a rock star wants to marry a Japanese idol singer who doesn't actually exist. She's a synthetic personality and it'd be like someone in our modern day trying to marry Hatsune Miku. She also is a synthetic voice personality that one can use to make their own vocals in a song. Even the Robocop movies ask what is human when most of the human is gone, yet the consciousness goes on. The essence of humanity lies at the heart of cyberpunk. Our fears, our hopes, our empathy, our dreams, our faults. What makes a person a person? So we're going to examine that today in this special episode of Cyberpunk Librarian. We're going to talk about what it is to be human when things exist that appear to be human, but yet they aren't. We're going to ask ourselves what separates humanity from the cold, logical machines that humanity is so good at building. We'll ask questions like, do we know, at a glance, what will separate us from sentient AI? Do we know what it is to be human in a world where humanity is a manufactured commodity? Do we understand the ways that we imbue our creations, our constructs, and our algorithms with the good and the bad aspects of our flawed human psyches. And finally, do androids dream of electric sheep? I'm Daniel Messer. Welcome to Cyberpunk Librarian. Android's Dream of Electric Sheep is a proto-cyberpunk novel and one of the foundational books in the cyberpunk genre. While the classic tropes aren't all there, you can see them. They're just right over there, just stepping out into the light. There's a post-apocalyptic civilization. There is some mention of cybernetic enhancement. There are androids that look and act almost exactly like people. There is noir, there is mystery, there are corporations possessing far too much power, and there is high-tech and low-life. It's all there, but it's not 
quite a cyberpunk story in the same way that Star Wars isn't quite a fantasy movie. It's skirting right along the edges, though. Yet the book is the basis of the 1982 cyberpunk cinema classic, Blade Runner, starring Harrison Ford, Sean Young, Rutger Hauer, Daryl Hannah, and Edward James Olmos. While there are significant changes from the book to the film, both stand as classics in the genre. And now, 35 years later, there's a sequel. Blade Runner 2049 brings back the familiar character of Rick Deckard, played by Harrison Ford, while introducing us to a world that is 30 years older than the original world of the first movie. In other words, the world of Blade Runner has aged almost in real time. I would talk about the original movie, but the thing is, there are five cuts of that film, five different interpretations, and... Actually, if you count the work print and the sneak preview edition, there are actually seven versions of the film. No matter which one I decided to talk about, it'd be upsetting to someone because I'd be leaving out their favorite version of the movie or something like that. Me, I'm partial to the final cut, but someone else will prefer the director's cut. But you know how I get around this? By talking about the book. <laughs> because there's only one book. Its author, Philip K. Dick, was a strange man in a world of strange men. Even now, the collection of science fiction authors is kind of a sausage fest consisting of, mostly, white, cisgendered, heterosexual males with strange thoughts who ask strange questions about what might happen in the future. I think all science fiction authors are a little strange. It goes with the territory, and that's perfectly okay. Most people consider artists, a category of people which includes authors, to be a little weird. Then again, that's why they're artists. They see the things most people don't, or can't. Clark envisioned communication satellites when such a thing didn't exist. Bradbury wrote about earbud headphones in Fahrenheit 451. Jules Verne wrote about submarines in 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. And Hugo Gernsback wrote about radar in 1911 in a book aptly titled Ralph 124C41+. When it comes to writing science fiction, the old saying holds true. You don't have to be crazy to work here, but it certainly helps. Though he was born in Chicago in 1928, Dick actually spent most of his life in California. He sold his first story in 1952. It was called Rouge and it was about a dog who was desperately confused about how his master's food, kept in circular containers outside the house, were repeatedly stolen by people he thought to be aliens from another planet. Actually, the circular containers are garbage cans and the aliens are sanitation workers. But while the humans just think the dog is being, well, a dog and barking at strangers, it could actually be that the Dog knows more than the humans comprehend. Philip K. Dick was a staunch anti-war supporter and dropped out of the University of California at Berkeley because, at the time, they had mandatory ROTC classes. Indeed, the subject of war appears in many of his novels, and war is never anything glorious. It's a blight, it's a shame, and it's a consequence that people bring upon themselves. The horrors of war are at the forefront of a popular show on Amazon Prime right now, a show based upon his book The Man in the High Castle. It depicts a world where the United States lost World War II. And we'll talk more about war as we get into electric sheep. A citizen of his time, he opposed the Korean and Vietnam Wars. He was anti-abortion and into animal rights movements. I'm not telling you this to give you a peek at his personality or to provide color, but because these things show up in almost right away in the book. Dick was also a proponent of drug rehabilitation programs, something that might surprise some people given that this is the man that claimed that another separate consciousness inhabited his mind. He once related a story about how a beam of pink light entered his mind and told him that his infant son was very sick and should be taken to a doctor. He did this, and, in fact, his son was sick, so let's hear it for pink beams of pure intelligence. But as an artist of his time, 
He experimented with drugs as a means to opening up his mind, his consciousness, to other worlds and different realities. While he, you know, he may have been bent in his own way, Philip K. Dick wasn't stupid. He realized that the physical toll that drugs took upon his body, and like Neil Young, he'd seen the needle and the damage done. In the end, he'd suffered from pancreatic damage and high blood pressure bought, brought on by the use of amphetamines. And these were the contributing factors to the stroke that ended his life in 1982. He died just after the release of Blade Runner. Now, before we dive in, you need to understand something about Philip K. Dick novels, and that's the fact that trying to do a single podcast about one of his books is an exercise in futility. His books are deep, my friends. There are layers upon layers and themes within themes. Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep is no different, as it covers topics and ideas ranging from the horrors of nuclear war to human-like androids. There is an entire subplot about religion. He explores what can be described as an early imagining of virtual reality and how it, how it affects those who use it. The commentary on media and television is in there. He explores sexuality, empathy, and the power of corporations. And, as you might expect, there's more than a little bit about animals. So, rather than try and tackle a book in one podcast that could easily be the subject of an entire series of podcasts, I'm going to focus on one thing, something that I also focused on back in episode 50 with my overview of Ghost in the Shell. I'm going to talk about what it is to be human, and what it is to be human in the world of 1992, or at least Androids Dreaming of Electric Sheep 1992. It's a world of androids and the people who hunt them. I'm going to try and keep things fairly spoiler-free, but I can't totally guarantee it. If you've not read this book, I highly recommend you get a copy. It's not a particularly long book, and it is entertaining. It's one of those books that you read it through, hopefully you enjoy it, and maybe you read it again, and you'll find something you missed that first time. And if you read it again, you'll find something you missed the second time, and third, and fourth. I really don't know how many times I've read this book, and I read it again as I you know, prepared for this podcast, and I found things that I had missed the first several times through. So, I think you might like how you can peel back the layers and see what's going on underneath. Or at least, what you think is going on underneath. There's plenty for your imagination to do. I'm also going to try and keep the movie at arm's length. The movie is amazing, don't get me wrong, it's one of my favorites, and there will probably be a few things here and there about it. But rather focus on differences and similarities and point out how the movie is far more cyberpunk than the book and that the Andes are called replicants in the movie and that the corporation has a different name and on and on and on. We're just going to focus on the book and humanity in an increasingly technological world. Okay then, let's go. If popular culture has taught us anything, it is that someday mankind must face and destroy the growing robot menace. The robots have descended on us from outer space, escaped from top secret laboratories, and even traveled back in time to destroy us. The world of Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep is that of a post-apocalyptic civilization recovering from an event called World War Terminus. Set in San Francisco, the city really isn't much of a city anymore. Deckard and his wife Iran live in a mostly empty apartment building. Deckard works for the San Francisco Police Department as a bounty hunter. His job? Retiring androids. That's a, that's a funny word there, retiring. It's a euphemism, of course. He's actually killing these androids. You see, it's illegal for an android to be on Earth, and if there is an android on the Earth, it's because they've probably killed their owner back on Mars and made their way back here. Because they're androids, they're intelligent, they're strong, they're fast. 
They're better than humans in many ways, and they don't think like humans normally do. That makes them harder to predict. Deckard has a few neighbors simply because so many people died as a result of the war, the nuclear fallout, or they've immigrated off-world to colonies on Mars. There's just not many people in that building. And it's not just the lives of humans at risk. Many animals went extinct because of the war, and only a few survived here and there. For that reason, animals are revered, and owning an animal is a status symbol. And we're not just talking about dogs or cats. Upon the roof of his apartment building, one of Deckard's few neighbors keeps a horse. Deckard himself owns a sheep, but that sheep has a secret, and you might have already guessed what it is. It's electric. The sheep is a, well, what is an android sheep called? If a male humanoid robot is an android and a female humanoid robot is a gynoid, then a provatoid, I guess? These electric animals are so well made that it's hard to tell if they're real or not. But why would anyone want one? Well, there's that aforementioned status symbol of the whole thing. Animals are expensive to buy, and their prices are kept in a guide that's updated regularly. It's like a Kelly Blue Book. You could look up the price of a sheep or an emu or a toad. Except toads are extinct. Beyond that, owning an animal not only means you had the money to buy it, but you had the wherewithal to take care of it. So there's a market in fake animals, and it's a lucrative one. Just like you can drop into certain Chinese street markets and buy an iPhone clone that's almost as good as the iPhone itself, in the world of electric sheep, you're able to buy fantastic electric animals that look and act like the real thing. They eat, they require tending, and so on. After all, we're talking about a society with the technology to build humanoid robots that are so well-made you can't easily tell the difference between the android and a real person. So of course they can build robotic animals that are just shy of being as good as the real thing. But there's another level to it. Owning an android shows that you possess empathy, an important emotion in the world of the novel. After a devastating war, so devastating that no one really remembers who started it, what exactly happened, and no one even really remembers if anyone won. After that kind of war and the destruction it brought upon humankind, empathy becomes an important part of the human experience. In fact, it becomes the basis of a religion called Mercerism. Wilbur Mercer is the center of Mercerism. He's a Sisyphean figure who eternally climbs a hill while unseen assailants hurl stones at him. Mercerists are able to connect with their spiritual leader through empathy boxes. These offer a virtual reality where they can talk with Mercer and experience his suffering. It's a communal experience, and believers experience and enhance their empathy by witnessing Mercer's travails and even getting hit by stones themselves. And it's empathy that separates the humans from the androids, or Andes, as many call them. But let's, let's talk about androids for a moment. Androids are free to people who are immigrating to Mars. They're an incentive. They're designed to provide companionship, information, assistance, and, most especially, labor. Make no mistake, androids are designed to be slaves, but they're likewise designed to be as close to human as possible. So close, in fact, that it takes special tests to determine whether or not an android is, if, you know, whether or not a uh, given humanoid, rather, is actually human. There have been several tests over the years, and the tests have to be updated occasionally because, as the technology progresses, the newer androids are able to pass the tests and thus appear to be human. And what are they looking for in these tests? What, what is the thing that separates the mechanical from the biological? Empathy. They're looking for empathy because while the Andes are programmed to simulate empathy, they don't do it as well as humans. They're close, but they're not there yet. There are tell telltale signs. They're, they've gotten to the point that these signs need to be measured accurately, and it's only fractions of a second in a delay that gives away the android. 
They're asked questions. Questions that any human in the novel would recoil at. And people are expected to recoil at these questions. They're, they're not very fun questions. They're kind of dark. Questions like, you're at a party and someone gives you a genuine leather wallet. How do you react? Now, keep in mind, most of the animals are dead. A leather wallet is an abomination. A human would flinch in horror at the idea, and, oddly enough, so would an android. <laughs> They're programmed to do so. But they don't do it as well, and they don't do it as quickly, and that's the giveaway. So, we have our first look at the center of humanity in the book, empathy. As sophisticated as the androids currently are, they're incapable of real empathy. Deckard comes face to face with this when he tests the niece of the CEO of one of the biggest android manufacturers in the world, the Rosen Association. Eldon Rosen and his company created a new brand of android with an advanced brain called the Nexus 6. They're the most lifelike androids so far, so realistic that Eldon questions the effectiveness of the tests that Deckard uses. Eldon has Deckard test his niece, Rachel, and she initially tests as an android. He explains that she's not. She's a young lady who grew up aboard a spaceship originally heading to a distant colony before turning back. So his test is flawed. At first, Deckard is reeling at this news. This test has never failed before. But over the course of the conversation, he notices something odd. Moments when Rachel refers to the Rosen's owl as it. Not him, not her. It. Humans wouldn't do that. So he comes up with one more question on the fly, and she fails. She is an android, and the test is good. Empathy is the gap between the humans and the androids, but there's also an underlying message here. Empathy can't be programmed. It's an innate human emotion. Oh, little trivia there you might have missed. The androids made by the Rosen Associations are uh, Nexus 6 androids. It's no accident that Google picked the name Nexus for its line of premium smartphones. Smartphones running the Android operating system. The thing is, Philip K. Dick's daughter and his estate didn't take too well to the idea of Google just appropriating the name. There were noises and lawyers, but in the end, well, Google's still using that name. The near failure of this test unsettles Deckard in a way that he's not quite prepared to deal with, because after the test is over, his own sense of empathy rises up in a new way, because he's starting to empathize with the androids. He's kind of starting to feel sorry for them. You know, the very things that he's supposed to kill. That's his job. That's how he gets paid, and it occurs to him that he gets paid more as the android bodies pile higher. But what if, what if they're not actually a danger? Sure, sure, they've killed their owners and they fled to Earth, but Deckard starts to see this in a new way, because they are slaves. And wouldn't a slave want to be free, even if it means taking a life and going on the run? He has a run-in with another bounty hunter named Phil Resch. Resch likes his job and hates androids. He enjoys killing them. Maybe he enjoys killing them too much. Deckard notices this, and Resch himself begins to wonder if he, you know, that Resch, might be an android. Resch tr turns it over in his mind. He agonizes over it, all the while assisting Deckard in the retirement of another android, one with a beautiful voice who's posing as an opera singer. Eventually, Resch uh, insists that, Des that Deckard tests him, and he seems willing to kill himself if he is an android. But he passes. He is indeed human. He's human, and he doesn't care. He doesn't care about killing the Andes, and this annoys Deckard. He questions his work and himself, so much so that he administers the test to himself, having Resch give him the numbers so he could make the computations. He passes. He too is human. But he notes a growing empathy for the androids. After Resch retires the opera singer, he wonders what it's all for. How can someone so talented, capable of producing such beautiful music, 
be a threat to society. Deckard wonders this. She wasn't out on a killing spree. She was rehearsing. She was visiting an art museum. Deckard goes home, and on the way he makes a big purchase with his money. He buys a goat. It's expensive. Such an animal. But he's got a good reason based in a question. Can he feel for this goat? What does he feel? Is the money more important, or is the life of the animal, the ownership of a living thing that is so rare and beautiful, is that more important? He arrives home to Iran, who is shocked at the goat's appearance. She knows the price of such a large animal. But she knows it's important to her husband, and she relents. In many ways, Iran is the most empathetic character in the novel. She wants to feel things that most people don't. She even sets her mood organ, a device that kind of takes the place of mind-expanding drugs in this novel. She sets this mood organ for six hours of depression at the beginning of the novel. She can feel happy. She can feel sad, aroused, any emotion. That's what this thing does. One can even dial the mood organ to an emotion that makes them want to use the device even when they don't want to use it. But she chooses depression to see what it's like, to be cleansed by it. This surprises her husband. Deckard didn't even know there was a setting for depression. Iran feels her husband's need for validation, not just of his job or replacing the electric sheep with a real animal, but also for his need to know that he's doing the right thing, that he is human, even though he's biologically human. Is he human? After a short break, Deckard's boss, Inspector Harry Bryant, calls him up and urges him on, pressuring him to continue the chase for these last three androids that are still on the loose. He wants them retired that evening. Deckard fights a bit with him, but eventually sets out. He's thinking the worst, that he will die, because he can't take on three Andes like this at the same time. He's tired. He's literally exhausted. And now he's going out to take on three things that are better than humans in many ways. He knows that they're living on the fringes of the city, a run-down suburban apartment building even more empty than his. Three Nexus 6 androids. So he calls for help. He calls Rachel, the android that initially tested as human. He wants her help, her insight, how to deal with killing these things, not just from a practical sense of shooting them, but from the emotional point of view. They meet at a hotel room. They talk. They argue about what he's going to do, what she's going to do. And eventually, they wind up in bed. It's against the law to have sex with an android, but for Deckard, this is a test. Can he feel love for her as an android? Can he love the machine? He thinks he might, and she tells him that she's in love with him. Yet, she eventually confesses that this is a thing she's done before, several times. She seduces and sleeps with bounty hunters to cause this exact reaction. Keep in mind that androids are a commodity, and they're mass-produced, which is why one of the androids Deckard will face that night looks exactly like Rachel. She knows that, and she's trying to use it against him to get him off the chase to stop the murder and the slaughter of androids. Deckard rejects her. He turns her loose. He doesn't love her. But he doesn't love her because she's an android. In some ways, he doesn't love her because she's a little too human in her coldness. He sets off after the last three androids on his hit list. And it will be his last hunt. The struggle with humanity in the world of electric sheep and murderous androids has empathy at its core. People need other people. It's why there are still cities at all, even after a post-apocalyptic nuclear nightmare. People needing people is the very reason that androids exist as an enticement to colonize Mars. There aren't a lot of people up there yet. You'll be roughing it on your own for a while. 
Here's a friend to take with you. They're so human-like, you can't tell the difference. But they lack empathy. And Philip K. Dick was big on empathy. It's something that shows up in many more of his books. He once wrote, quote, A human being without the proper empathy or feeling is the same as an android built so as to lack it, either by design or mistake. We mean, basically, someone who does not care about the fate which his fellow living creatures fall victim to. He stands detached, a spectator, acting out by his indifference John Donne's theorem that no man is an island, but giving that theorem a twist, that which is a mental and moral island is not a man. Unquote. We live in a world where news of a mass shooting gets shoved to the top of a Google search because the algorithms detected that it was suddenly a popular story on 4chan. A Google Photos algorithm accidentally tags an African American as a gorilla. We don't have androids, at least not yet, but humans are imperfect creatures building imperfect machines and imperfect algorithms. And there is a strong common thread uh, through a lot of apocalyptic science fiction that deals with the near extinction of the human species. You see it in movies like Terminator. You've seen it in books like Dune and in short stories like I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream. Human beings build machines that think, but they aren't machines that feel. They are not machines that care. Sci-fi has a habit of coming true, just Look around at how many things have been predicted by Star Trek alone, from flip phones to iPads. And it's happening again. Google, HP, and whoever else, they'll blame the algorithm. Oh, it's not our fault. The algorithm mistakenly labeled those black people as gorillas. Oh, it's not our fault that fake news showed up at the top of this page. That was something wrong with the algorithm. But this is nonsense. Actually, to be honest, it's just straight up bullshit. Because those algorithms were created by Google, or by Samsung, or by Apple, or by HP, or whoever working at whatever company, it's not like they don't have control over their own code. Or do they? Hell, Google Translate started talking to itself one day, in a language that its developers didn't understand. We build thinking machines, but not caring machines. Caring is inefficient. Why slow down a perfectly good process so you can build in something that resembles caring or concern? Well, that is happening in one major area. Self-driving cars. Tesla, Waymo, and others are discovering an age-old problem called the trolley problem. Given a situation where your self-driving car might slam into a minivan and kill a family of four, would it be better to suddenly jerk the wheel to one side and possibly kill you? the driver. Sure, it's a question of ethics and logic, but it's a start. It's a question that can be answered in several, in several ways, and new rules can be added along with new situations. What if it's a family of four, but there's two people in your car? What if there's a family of four in both cars? For instance, what if your car also has a family of four in it? Does it avoid the car in front of you and avoid killing eight people? by jumping the curb and killing two people on the sidewalk as it plows into a building. What's the right answer? I can tell you this, I haven't a clue. And I hope, there, that's, I hope that's never a decision I'll ever have to make, in real life or in code. But I offer this. It's a decision that starts with an incredibly basic and very important human emotion. Empathy. The developers who wind up coding that into self-driving algorithms and instructions, they're thinking about it. They're picturing themselves on the sidewalk, or in one car, or in the other car, or watching it from the other side of the street. It's a trap, really, because there is no right answer here. Someone's going to die. There are answers that may be better than others, but the logic is too murky. The data is incomplete. I know for a fact this is the kind of thing that keeps developers and science fiction authors working overtime. And it keeps them up at night. But when they sleep, what do they dream of? Oh. 
And that wraps up another episode of Cyberpunk Librarian. Thank you for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed something a little different, a little celebration of the new Blade Runner movie that's out today, as a matter of fact. I intend to go see it within the next few days, and, you know, I'm kind of looking forward to it. I know, I know it's another Hollywood sequel. It's another, you know, another thing from a previous generation that they're rehashing, but by God, it's Blade Runner, and I'm... I think I will probably enjoy it because I'm a sucker for this kind of thing. So I hope you enjoyed the show. It was kind of a stream of consciousness thing. I kind of got into a sort of Philip K. Dick mindset where I just kind of sat down and started writing. I know there were some places where it's like, what, what's he talking about now? Oh, I see what he's talking about. And, you know, I, I hope it was easier for you to follow along. The song you're currently digging on is Grey Matter by Flex Vector. Earlier in the show, you heard The Beat Goes On, Dancer in the Dark, and The Killbots Are Coming, also all by Flex Vector. The opening track, as always, is Belly Dance at Abisu by Rio Mieshta, and you will find links to all of this stuff in the show notes at cyberpunklibrarian.com slash podcast. Cyberpunk Librarian is hosted by the Internet Archive at archive.org. There are some great people doing great things at the Internet Archive, preserving and saving our digital world for posterity and for people to look at far into the future. And hey, just a quick shout out to a new podcast by the amazing Jason Scott of textfiles.com fame. He's got a new podcast called Jason Talks His Way Out of It, where he... Uh, he ch- he talks about things like how he came to work for the archive and what it, you know what he thinks about when he thinks about archiving and digital history and things like that. He's about three episodes into it by now. It is incredibly good. So if you're if you're into that kind of thing, you might want to check it out in your favorite podcatcher of choice. As I said, it's called Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It. Definitely worth your time if you kind of dig this show. If you want to join in the conversation online, well, you can find Cyberpunk Librarian at cyberpunklibrarian.com and on Facebook at facebook.com slash cyberpunklibrarian. If you're into consuming your audio through a video medium, well, I am not one to judge, and you will find Cyberpunk Librarian at youtube.com slash cyberpunklibrarian. You can also reach out to me online if you would like to do so. I love hearing from the listeners. My uh, my Twitter handle is at Vibrarian. That's B-I-B-R-A-R-I-A-N. It's like librarian, but it starts with a B. Or you can uh, you can hit me up via the old SMTP tried and true email method at cyberpunklibrarian at protonmail.com. I would love to hear from you. You'll find links to all kinds of nifty stuff in the show notes at cyberpunklibrarian.com slash podcast, the music, some things from this show that I talked about. So, hey, be sure to check out the website. You can drop a comment on there if you feel so inclined. So, hey, I hope you have a great weekend. I hope you enjoy the uh, the new Blade Runner movie that's out. I'm kind of, you know, I'm, I'm in one of those moods where it's like, oh, this could be real good or, boy, this could be real bad, but... I'm hopeful. I'm eternally hopeful. And, you know, that's just how I am. So I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to finish a few things and probably go see that movie this weekend myself. So, hey, take care. I'll see you on the next episode. And remember, you don't have to be high tech to live low budget, but it certainly helps if you're a cyberpunk. Take care out there.